Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's session, which I'm looking forward to moderating and hosting today, is called Regulatory Environment in Crypto. Crypto has been a buzzword that kind of has stayed around for a while, both in terms of the industry and obviously in the general public. Things such as Bitcoin and other interesting things in the space have been propping up. But what exactly does that involve with regulatory landscape across the world and specifically maybe in our host country today of Turkey? So looking forward to today's panel discussion with amazing panelists. So I wanted to quickly introduce them on stage and have them introduce them themselves as well in detail. So the first person we have today, her name is Elson Karate of Solak and Partners. Elson, do you want to quickly elaborate about your career and yourself and your organization? Yeah, for sure. Um, so thanks uh, for this. It's great to be here and talking to this audience. Um, so this is Alçin Karatay. I am uh, the managing partner of Solak and Partners Law Firm, um, which is based in Istanbul and working a lot with technology firms. And I personally am interested in cryptocurrency and blockchain sector um, from 2016 and watching uh, this incredible area growing up within this series. So um, I would be glad to share anything that I know with respect to Turkish law um, and the regulatory perspective here. Thank you so much, Elsin. I'm glad I pronounced your name correctly. <laughs> so the next the next person, thank you so much. The next person I want to introduce, my our second panelist for today, her name is Claire Wells of Coinbase. Claire, do you want to elaborate about yourself, your career? Thanks, Richie, and, and thanks for having me on today. Excited to be here. Um, so as I said, my name's Claire Wells. Uh, I'm Associate General Counsel International at Coinbase. So I, I lead our regulatory engagement, working with policymakers and regulators around the world to promote proportionate uh, and appropriate regulation for the crypto market. Prior to Coinbase, um, I also headed up the legal function for other uh, US fintechs launching internationally, including Circle, which launched USDC, um, Plaid, which is the open banking platform, and Tilt, which was acquired by Airbnb. I started off my career at Allen & Overy. Excellent. An impressive career for both of you. Thank you so much, Claire, for that introduction, as well as Alison. So now let's begin with the panel discussion here. So, so obviously, today's topic, regulatory environment and crypto, it's a very interesting space. I think, I think both of you feel as well. And we see countries such as the US that hasn't necessarily developed a regulatory framework, whereas you see others such as El Salvador that actually has adopted it as a national currency, right, with Bitcoin. What are your opinions, both Alison and Claire, in terms of, you know, with regards to the advancements of legislations in crypto globally, and then maybe you want to elaborate a little bit in Turkey as well. So uh, let's start off with, how about Claire, because, you know, you're based uh, abroad uh, from our host country. What are your thoughts on this in terms of the diversity of legislation happening from, you know, the likes of the U.S., and then obviously things such as in El Salvador that have made headlines last year? Sure, it's a great question, and, and I hope, uh, given Coinbase's background as one of the leading crypto uh, exchange platforms operative since um, 2012. I can help share some insights there. Um, I think to date there have been four general approaches in different jurisdictions. The first being sort of innovation first, so leveraging existing regulations and monitoring um, in the direction of, of uh, crypto development to see whether a proportionate tailored regulatory framework over time uh, might work. The second being public-private partnerships, so collaborative engagement with policymakers, regulators in the private sector to work together through task force, innovation hubs, et cetera, um, to create uh, frameworks like, for example, the MAS in, in Singapore has done. Um, and then the third, I think, is a sort of crypto-specific regulatory approach. Uh, so creating tailored regimes for this space. Examples include Switzerland, Japan, uh, New York in, in the US. And I think in upcoming in the EU and the UK, we're seeing obviously Mika markets and crypto assets regulation, and, and then also the stable coin regime coming out of the UK. And then finally, um, the restrictive uh, approach, which, so essentially banning, banning the use of crypto, um, mm. which uh, obviously impacts innovation and could have significant impact on, on sort of public, pri public policy priorities. Um, and actually, we've seen a number of countries who initially proposed bans now reversing that decision. Um, Elton, I don't know whether you agree with, the, with those four approaches. 
Yes, that's that's I also agree with that too. And um, maybe just giving some information about Turkey, um, just um, within last month, our president actually told that there is a crypto regulation which will be coming soon. So we are expecting something to be enacted in Turkey. But um, for now, Turkey was more into uh, looking, watching out, seeing what is happening and trying to understand, you know, how they should act on regulating this issue. But again, this is a very um, vast area. And, uh, you know, from my perspective, from what I'm seeing, the first area that will be regulated um, in Turkey will probably be related to crypto asset trading. And that's uh, one of the areas that I have seen also in the world that a um, lot of the uh, countries are trying to regulate or have regulated and providing licensing uh, obligations to this trading platform. So I believe when uh, the government see a reason uh, for cons consumer well-being or the just uh, users' well-being and protection, uh, that's the first place that they want to look into. Thank you for that. And, and, and taking a step back, you know, I think for those that are in the wider fintech space or not, you know, common person in terms of, you know, the, 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 the grandma or our neighbor, are all into into crypto now, right? It seems to be this this common thing. They might they might not know what fintech is, nor even crypto itself, but they'll know things such as Bitcoin, and it can make a lot of money. So, why do you both think that the public is so fascinated with crypto? And and is and you are you seeing this as well? You know, both globally, obviously it is, but but also in our host country of Turkey. So maybe else, do you want to kind of kick it off because you were touching a bit on it with regards to Turkey first. And then Claire, if you wanted to add anything else in terms of why do you think the public is fascinated with crypto? Yeah, for sure. So uh, Turkish population is very young and we are very interested in technology. And there are some researches done about this, you know, how Turkish public sees cryptocurrency, do they know about it? And every research that comes up just shows you know, the young population's interest in actually technology and what cryptocurrency and blockchain is providing to us. So, of course, there is um, a lot of fascination with crypto because, you know, at first it was the ICOs, which created a very big hype. Now it's the trading and DeFi protocols, which, you know, some people see as an easy way of making money and uh, access to different financial instruments still. I believe, you know, from what I've seen, it's not the only reason that Turkish people is interested in that, and they're very uh, much looking into what's happening um, from technology-wise, and uh, they just want to be connected to the new systems. And um, just uh, to give a number to you, one of the uh, trading platforms in Turkey just announced that they now have more than 5 million users which is, a, I think, a very big number. It's just one. And um, it's really interesting to see how um, things are going on and how Turkish people is interested in crypto. Thank you for that. And, and like you said, a very young population and following similar trends globally. Claire, do you have like a different point of view on that from, from your own base and the rest of the world? I mean, why is the world fascinated with crypto? I think there are a number of reasons. I, I also think to, to add to Elton's point, um, it, I think the Turkish market is, is maybe the fourth largest crypto asset market in the world, which is quite an interesting statistic that I read recently. Um, crypto assets have the power to give people a new way to control their own finances, granting unprecedented levels in terms of it. Uh, innovation uh, re relating to security, speed, accessibility, affordability. Um, and this all provides the, sort of the foundations or the underpinnings for a, a new generation of, of responsible financial services. But I think the promise of crypto goes beyond, you know, just an exciting new speculative asset class. It provides a fundamental new layer for, for the Internet's infrastructure, public blockchains that are open, global and mutable. You know, if, if Web 1 and 2 was about sharing data, info, media and comms, I think Web Point three is, is all about value exchange, governance, and trust, and crypto provides that. 
Excellent. Going on to the fascinating world of crypto to the public, I now have an, another fascinating question for you both. <laughs> so how, how exactly do you see this? We were touching upon this earlier in terms of it being you know, restricted or banned in some countries. I believe there are nine at the moment where crypto is banned. And there are others as well where it's restricted, such as countries you know, like Nigeria, Egypt, China, in terms of those levels of banned or restricted. Do you see this happening more? Because there was a comment earlier with Elson, I think it was you, who said that uh, some countries have, are reversing that in terms of their bans that they've made. Do you both agree with that? Do you disagree on that in terms of banning crypto is going to be a trend? Or do you see some type of a hybrid model or not? Uh, how about Clara? Because I think Elson, you touched on it first. Clara, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. I think, you know, banning isn't necessarily the most efficient way to protect the market. If regulation is about, you know, creating uh, creating a secure environment um, for, for consumers uh, and, and also the promotion of innovation, I think uh, actually, you know, outright banning could, could lead to um, certain countries falling behind in terms of the digital transformation that we're seeing happening across the globe. Um, and over-regulation or under-regulation can lead to regulatory arbitrage. You know, this is a global solution available across a number of different markets. Uh, and so players seeking to establish businesses uh, across the globe will, will do so in more advantageous jurisdictions. Although it, I'm, not advoca I'm not advocating or saying that um, players are necessarily looking for um, deregulated jurisdictions. Actually, a large number of, of statistics show that large VCs and institutional players and, and uh, you know, Coinbase specifically are looking for jurisdictions that will allow cl clarity and security for the market in order to develop the business and, and ensure that, you know, consumer protection principles are, are promoted here. So I think a balanced approach to regulation is, is necessary across uh, the jurisdictions and also um, uh, a, a unified, um, cohesive, harmonized approach across jurisdictions is necessary given the global nature of the technology. So I actually could not agree more. <laughs> and that, that's also, you know, my point of view, because, you know, the more you try to bend this, especially with, you know, most of the crypto assets, you can access them through wallets. Um, and um, it is very hard, technically hard to ban it too. So if you try to ban crypto assets, crypto asset trading, it just, um, makes the consumers, the users in a more uh, vulnerable position uh, within the um, platforms that they're using because they will not be regulated or at least um, be in control within that country's regulation. So I also believe that we need regulations to uh, see innovation, understand it, do not um, limit it or prohibit it and uh, try to create um, environments for this to go on and there has been uh, you know some words around turkey you know will crypto be banned uh, somehow but i don't think the turkish approach uh, is to ban cryptocurrencies in any way um, but for sure we are also a member of financial action task force which uh, provides some regulatory environment for uh, anti-money laundering uh, regulations. So we will probably see some regulation, but it, I don't think that it will be in uh, an nature of banning this. And I don't think that, again, it's not a good solution uh, for cryptocurrencies for sure. Excellent. And, and you both have clearly said there should be a balance. Banning is not the, the answer. So there has to be some type of control, some type of frameworks and type of environment where legislation can help control that, in this case, cryptocurrencies, right? So obviously, because the theme is around regulatory, around crypto. So how do you both see legislation then being able to help control cryptocurrencies? So obviously, you know, obviously from the consumer and from the wider ecosystem to help prevent the likes of you know, money, la money laundering, which is a huge challenge, even in crypto, as we know. But how can that actually work in practice in terms of regulatory effects from any jurisdiction to control cryptocurrencies? Let's start off with, uh, from maybe from a global point of view, Claire, do you have any ideas or thoughts or opinions on what that can look like 
I mean, should it be more laissez-faire? Should it be more uh, certain aspects? I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a great question. And I just wanted to also add, I think, you know, there's, as you mentioned, a lot of focus has been around, particularly in the press, around sort of the AML issues in relation to crypto. Mm -hmm. But one thing I'd add is, or one thing I'd, I'd rebut there is that actually, you know, if you look at the statistics to date, uh, less than 0.1% of, of crypto transactions are related to illicit activity, which is actually less than the traditional financial markets. And inf uh, and, and I think um, AML is an imp uh, and counter-terrorist financing are important um, controls and checks that we, we need to put in place in relation to the crypto market, but they, the risk shouldn't be overstated. Um, and I also think the technology actually affords greater insights for for law enforcement because you know it's a it's a an, a an open global immutable chain so actually with a whole host of product offerings you can see uh throughout the chain where sort of bad actors have have, have been transacting and, and block those addresses something that you know traditional financial services uh, and the technology doesn't afford so that, that's just one thing i'd add um but in terms of uh, the best approach in relation to crypto regulation. I think, you know, realizing the benefits of the technology and, and the innovations to better protect it, uh, investors and, and ensure a fair sort of orderly market is ought to be the priority. Um, with that in mind, I think it's important to establish net new rules and oversight structures for, for digital assets and, and disclosures, which draw upon existing regulation. But I think it's important to realize the differences um, in, in in crypto assets to the traditional sort of financial services and and their ability to to enable more efficient practices, promote investor protections, and and essentially build and maintain confidence in the markets, realizing the the benefits of of the technology um, to promote essentially like low cost, efficient, safe access to 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 a new form of financial services. Alson, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, you know, myself, from view, I'm more of a less a fair um, type of person. I don't think that, you know, technology should be regulated a lot, but my views changes for crypto assets because, you know, the way you look at it, of course, there are a lot of ways of use of, you know, how crypto assets will be included in our lives but from what we see right now it's using um used a lot in uh financing in payment systems and um in different in creating different financial instruments and there are a lot that can happen on that area and for sure uh you know when we're talking about financing payment transactions between people um, there should be some regulation and not regulating it and just leaving it to what's already been happening actually creates a lot of gray areas for crypto assets. And when you're looking at it from a lawyer's perspective, from a company's perspective, it is very hard to walk um, within these lines to understand you know, what you will be fitted in and um, the laws which have been created before, thinking about you know, central authorities and not decentralized uh, networks is creating a lot of difficulties in understanding and applying this. So um, I believe you know, for this, uh, especially for that purposes, uh, it is not possible to not regulate, but uh, it should be um, the government's policies to understand you know, how we can regulate it. And uh, Claire made a point earlier about you know, um, international approach and uh, trying to make everything being compatible with other countries because this technology actually allows us to have um, transborder transactions very easy, uh, international transactions very easy, but the differences of laws of regulation actually, uh, I think, uh, slows down the innovation uh, in a very important way. So, you know, if the countries can find some way to work together on this, that would be the changing point for crypto assets. Thanks, you, thanks to both of you for that. I think it's interesting. You've touched on some key themes here. And I kind of want to ask a final question to you both as time approaches. But where do you actually see 
the future of cryptocurrency is heading? I think you've touched on some themes such as collaboration, regulation, but also laissez-faire, right? So where do you see the future of cryptocurrencies heading, both globally, and then also we'll add to our host country, Turkey here, let's say five to 10 years. Claire, do you wanna kick off with that final question? Sure, I mean, look, it's in, impossible to say the, the direction of travel. I think the, the, we're still in the sort of early stages of, of this market and of the potential that this, this uh, technology offers. So in my mind, um, this is just the start of a sort of new digital age and a, a new digital uh, transformation, whether it be in, in the traditional financial services industry or um, in, in relation to uh, the metaverse more broadly. I think this, you know, we're just seeing the start of, of this exciting, exciting new world. Excellent. Awesome, go ahead. Um, so, you know, um, I just don't want to uh, put myself in a position, you know, watching this uh, later years and just laughing at me. <laughs> so I'm just... You know, but, but those are fun, though. Those are fun. You either got it right or wrong or you were neutral. <laughs> <laughs> so I can be very wrong with this, but, you know, it's, it's very interesting from, um, you know, the, the point that I'm looking, although it's not directly related to cryptocurrencies, crypto assets, I think... Um, DAOs, which uh, will provide, you know, decentralized autonomous organizations is very interesting. I see, I can imagine a lot of applications of that. That's uh, something that I'm looking forward to. Uh, another thing that, you know, excites me, you know, with the uh, security token offerings um, happening in the world and um, securitization through tokens, that can lead to a very interesting idea. You know, I am um, working a lot with MA deals and, you know, I can see a lot of applications of, you know, shares being tokenized, you know, a lot of rights like drag alongs, tag alongs, which causes a lot of problems, which can be easily sorted out with smart contracts. So that kinds of things uh, really uh, excites me. I'm looking forward to that, but, um, you know, who can say what will happen in five to 10 years, but for sure, I think we will see more crypto, hear more crypto. I don't think that it will go uh, the other way. Thank you for that both. And, you know, it's interesting, you know, you know, Bitcoin, non-fundable tokens, NFT, you know, NFT stands for that, but I'm going to leave it with nice final thought. So Claire, give us a final, final thought for today's panel before we end it. Go. Final words. Sure. Nice final thought. The final thought is, you know, at Coinbase, we're powering the crypto ecosystem for a new financial system for the internet age, which we feel is crucial for, for Web 3.0 and, and excited for the start of this journey. Excellent. Alison. So I'm, I'm very excited as a lawyer to be working on this area. And, um, you know, I just met great people through this area. And, you know, to whoever listening, I'll just uh, recommend to look more into it and think more about it. And uh, I think uh, more interesting uh, innovation will come through uh, with crypto assets in the future. Thank you both for your nice final thoughts. And my nice final thought is regulatory environment and crypto. It's obviously an interesting subject because obviously globally and in our host country, Turkey, it is a topic of interest and it's a topic of popularity across the board. So again, I'm the moderator for today, Richie Santos Diaz. It was an absolute pleasure to have you both today. Thank you so much, Elson. Thank you so much, Claire. And enjoy the rest of Istanbul FinTech Week. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having me.